Good morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, start uh, the meeting of the Transportation Committee. Welcome back, everybody, from, uh, from a summer break. Um, we have no regrets, though. I guess we're not done by noon. Councilor Chernyshenko may have to leave us. Uh, about 11. Okay. Um, no declarations of interest received. Uh, confirmation of the minutes of June the 30th, 2015. Carried. Thank you. Um, uh, communications uh, as, um, as provided and noted in the agenda. We'll go through the agenda now. Um, first is, uh, uh, number one is snow removal and school drop-off zones. Uh, was a motion to be brought by Councillor Fleury. I might as well deal with that now. I believe, Councillor Fleury, you're going to be withdrawing the motion and substituting with a direction to staff. Is that correct? Correct, Mr. Chair. Can I uh, speak to the item? Or? Um, yeah, why don't we just do it now, it's, it's, if you can do it quickly. So uh, I want to start off by thanking uh, Kevin and yourself for, for meeting with me on this matter. Um, to be clear, I think our, our crews are, are, are uh, doing what's expected out of the, main, the current maintenance standard. There, there has been some little issues of coordination uh, with regards to snowbanks. So it's really the, the road plow would go, it accumulates on the side of the road, and then sidewalk plow would go at, at a different time. So uh, the direction to staff is really to try to coordinate some of those works uh, within the existing standard. So it reads as follow. Uh, direction to staff as part of the winter operation review to explore opportunities to coordinate road and sidewalk maintenance of school loading zones to explore opportunities to partners with the school boards to coordinate winter maintenance activities with the City of Ottawa with the goal of keeping sidewalks edge in front of the school loading zones clear within existing and all of this within existing resources obviously. Okay. It's, co it's coordination of work. Okay and uh, Mr. Wiley that direction is acceptable? Uh, through the chair yes. Okay thank you. Uh, we're going to hold number two because we have a presentation from the Ministry of Transportation on the detailed design for the widening and rehabilitation of Highway 417 from Maitland Avenue to Island Park. Uh, number three is the status update, transportation inquiries and motions for the period ending the 21st of August 2015. Received? Uh, number uh, four is the Uptown uh, Rideau Parking Assessment. Um, received? Uh, number five is the um, 2016 Municipal Vehicle and Equipment Replacement Plan, uh, and that's uh, for receipt. I do have direction for staff. Um, is it received? I just have a question. Okay, so we'll hold it and we'll, we'll deal with that. Um, number uh, number six is um, the pedestrian crossing treatments in Ottawa update to the Ontario traffic manual and uh, we have a presentation um, from staff and also uh, in the corner over there we have what one of the new devices is going to look like. Um, so uh, Greg Kent will be speaking of that and telling us a little bit more about, uh, about the device and how they're going to be implemented. Uh, numbers, uh, so we'll hold that. Number seven is right of way policy, uh, right of way lighting policy uh, update. Carried? Yes. Quick question on that one as well. Okay, we'll hold that then. Um, and uh, number eight is the street side spots pilot project. Now we do have a delegation, but the delegations indicated that they have no need to speak if we're going to, uh, if we're going to carry this. Uh, carried? Carried. Okay. Thank you very much. Is that good? Okay. And number nine is the carp road widening, Highway 417 to Hazeldean Road, environmental assessment study recommendations. We both have a presentation and we have a number of delegations, so we will hold that. Number 10 is the encroachment waiver, Lajeva block building boards and planters. Um, and that is that, um, is that carried? Carried. carried. Okay. And um, information uh, previously distributed as uh, noted in the agenda. So we'll go back. 
and uh, go to the first held item, which is uh, number two, which is the Ministry of Transportation's presentation on the widening and rehabilitation of Highway 417 from Maitland to Island Park. Uh, good morning. Uh, perhaps you could start. We can all see sitting here the name tags and who you are, but maybe if you want to sort of go across and, and say who you are as you begin your presentation, that would be helpful to the people in the gallery. Um, I'm the uh, consultant project manager, Lincoln McDonald with MMM Group. I'm the ministry project manager, Kate Green. Uh, highway design manager, MMM Group. I think you're all going to have to lean a bit more into your mics. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, we'll turn it over to you then. Okay. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for letting us uh, have this opportunity. Um, this uh, delegation and presentation is for the Highway 417 widening from uh, Maitland Avenue to Highland Park Drive, uh, known as contract number five within the uh, ministry. Um, gives you some background on, on the assignment. Um, the preliminary design and environmental assessment for this project was completed in between 2002 and 2008 to review the infrastructure and operational issues from Highway 417 from 416 to Anderson Road. Uh, the recommended plan included widening 417 from three to four main line lanes in each direction, from 416 to Carling Avenue, and from Metcalf to 174. The design recommendations for the Auto Queensway Corridor were developed through the contact sensor design process. Um, this was to ensure an overall planned expansion and rehabilitation of 417 through Ottawa that was consistent and had a historically planned aesthetic vision. The uh, Transportation Environmental Study Report documenting the recommended plan received environmental clearance in 2008. The preliminary design EA study for the rehab rehabilitation of Highway 417 bridges from immediately west of Maitland Avenue to immediately east of Island Park Drive was completed between 2004 and 2005. The purpose of the study was to evaluate the structural conditions of the bridges within this area and determine rehabilitation needs, develop plans to accommodate highway and city street traffic during the rehabilitations, review opportunities to address other deficiencies at the time of the rehabilitations, and address environmental impacts. The Transportation Environmental Study Report documenting the recommended plan for this area was received and placed to receive environmental clearance in 2005. The Ministry of Transportation then initiated the detailed design and it started in 2005 as well, December. So to date, four contracts have been constructed. Um, basically contract one was the Island Park Bridges. It was the first rapid replacement uh, used by MTO, con uh, by MTO. Uh, followed by, and that was in 2007, followed by contract number two, which was the Clyde Avenue Bridges, which was done in 2008, again with the rapid replacement technology. Contract three consisted of the Carling Eastbound Bridges, a rapid replacement again, and it was completed in 2011. And contract four was the rapid replacement of Kirkwood Bridges and the Carling Westbound Bridges, and that was completed in 2003. So the remaining works now consist of widening of 417 from Maitland to Island Park and the rehabilitation of the Maryville Road structure. So as I indicated, the widening will, will be to the outside, will provide four lanes of traffic in each direction. There will be a rehabilitation, conventional rehabilitation of the Maryville Road overpass with a widening to the south of approximately five meters. There will be replacement of existing noise barriers within the project limits. One section is just no on the north side of the 417, just east of Maitland Avenue, and a section on the south side of the 417, just east of Marvel Road. Also included within the works will be retaining walls, drainage improvements, roadside protection, highway signage, illumination, ATMS, and landscaping, as well as traffic management for the construction staging.
There is a commitment within the Tusser to maintain three lanes of traffic in each direction during peak periods during the construction. This will be accomplished through the use of movable barrier. We will require some temporary limited interest property needs to help with the uh, access and egress to the outside of the highway for construction. And there will be some temporary highway realignments uh, within the existing highway. Construction is to be completed in two primary stages, what we term as outside inside. So they'll build the outside first and then move traffic out and reconstruct the median. Uh, the transition from Highway 417 Stage 1 to 417 Stage 2 requires a series of temporary highway realignments, uh, basically over the Melville Road Bridge as part of the rehabilitation of the bridge. So the Melville structure widening is to the south. During Stage 1, we'll be working on the substructure widening, and we'll be cl closing one of the pedestrian accesses. There are two currently under Melville Road. Uh, we'll be closing one, providing access on one side. The cyclist will, will, the existing bicycle lane right now ends before it hits the Maryville structure. So the intent is that the cyclist either take the lane or they can get off and walk around the provided uh, pedestrian access. Stage two is basically a flip of stage one. And we work on the, on the other side and do the same thing as we just did. Stage three requires um, two 36-hour full closures of Merville Road for the setup and takedown of the formwork required for the widening. Um, and there'll be advanced notice of this to, to everybody to let them know when it's happening. Basically, in general, our traffic management will consist of the contractor required to organize an incident management team, which will include members of the City of Ottawa's traffic incident management group, M2 operations and contract staff, m contract administrator and contractor's key staff. The meetings with the incident management team will start at the beginning of construction prior to the shutdown of each winter season, at the beginning of the spring following the winter shutdown, and at the end of stage one prior to the transition to stage 1A. Public notification will consist of advanced signing on Highway 417 to notify motors of upcoming ramp and or off road closures during the construction. Detour route signing to be in place during ramp and off and on road closures. Upcoming and ongoing ramp and on or road closures to be communicated will be by public via bilingual media releases, radio, television, social media, public notices, project website, MTO's travel road information portal, City of Ottawa's interactive tra traffic map, and Provincial Highways Call Center. Ramp closures. There will be extended ramp closures, um, primarily within stage one, which will be the outside portion of the construction. Uh, they will be required to reconstruct the ramps during removal because the existing ramps consist of some concrete base, some final complete tie-ins, and construct the retaining walls. Closure durations will vary from a single weekend to up to five weeks, with the exception of the east-to-east on-ramp at Carling Avenue, which will be closed for the duration of stage one and the transition to stage two. There will be no consecutive on-ramp or off-ramp closures, with the exception again of the west-east and the east-east ramps on Carling Avenue during the transition period to stage two. We have undertaken a traffic analysis as part of this assignment. Uh, the city network currently is operating at or near capacity, and adding traffic will result in most intersections probably exceeding capacity, including approaches not used by detour traffic. Adjustments to signal timings would not adequately address these operations issues. Local traffic will likely seek alternate routes using alternate travel modes or shift travel times. To keep the intersections operating on a septal level of service, 10 to 35 percent of traffic would need to divert off or off the signed detour routes. So primarily route traffic will be detoured via Carling Avenue. Uh, the map's not as clear as we'd like it, but it basically shows where we're doing ramp closures, which we, we might be possibly taking. With respect to noise and the existing noise barriers, the existing heights are approximately four meters. They're being increased to five. They are the existing old steel corrugated steel ones that are in very bad condition. Um, and I mentioned we'll be replacing the one on the east 
of Maitland Avenue on the north side and one on the south side east of Maryville Road. Uh, the noise assessment has been completed based on the MTO environmental guide for noise. Uh, the, uh, no other area qualifies for noise barriers within this quarter. Uh, during construction, there will be typical noise, construction noise to be expected. Uh, we will provide specifications in the contract to control the noise, as well as identifying noise sensitive areas, providing timing constraints. It is anticipated that there will be night work required, and therefore a, noise bylaw, a, no, a municipal noise bylaw exemption will be sought. Uh, with respect to landscaping, uh, vegetation will be really required. Uh, where feasible, the existing large diameter trees will be protected. And then final vegetation reinstatement efforts will focus on the areas where we think they'll survive and have the best chances of survival and to uh, accentuate features. Um, that's the end of our presentation. If we're open for questions, if anybody has any. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions for the delegation? Uh, Councillor Chernyshenko and then Councillor DeRose. Um, thank you. It's uh, perhaps as much for the delegation as it, is for, as it is for city staff. We continue to have a challenge um, <clears throat> whenever we're in a situation where um, a cycling lane is closed and we are saying, you know, single file, share the lane, um, although 99% of maybe not quite that high, but a large majority of drivers will choose to respectfully follow at a, you know, uh, the same speed as a cyclist, knowing that's where the cyclist has to be. Um, and, and many cyclists will claim the lane. Uh, there is still a lot of nervous behavior around that, both cyclists being reticent to claim the whole lane as they should and end up being in a situation where they might get squeezed or some drivers feeling like, hey, he's, he or she is holding me up and moving through. I'm wondering what can be done, done in terms of if, if, if we have to do that. Very clear signage, and I, I hate to play the nanny here, but almost large explanatory signage saying the cyclist must be in this location. Um, all drivers are expected to, you know, to, to respect that because the existing signage that we have um, just doesn't seem to be working for either road user. Yeah. Uh, the, the intent is that the, the area would be signed quite visibly for, for bikes to ensure that they, the drivers are aware that's a shared lane. Um, I'm not sure if the recent uh, changes in the law will help as well, given the fact that they have to maintain a one meter clearance from, from bikes now, so that, that hopefully will emphasize it a little bit more. Uh, and the option is going to be there for them too if they feel uncomfortable to use the, the area that we're providing for pedestrian and cyclist traffic to get underneath the structure. So. Yeah, I think it is something that's an ongoing thing to follow up with, uh, with, with our city staff as to how we might sign that better to you know, be, yep. be clear to people. This is, this is the way this is to be used during such a temporary uh, period. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question will be around the uh, ATMSs that we're installing on the highway. Uh, are we going to be informing our commuter that uh, it will be uh, traffic condition or will be accident or anything in this uh, line uh, just for, for safety reason or just will be because we can see the one in the 401 like when you're traveling you can give commuter like what's happening ahead and uh, if there's an accident or detour or anything like that. Uh, So, so the, the intent is, is, I'm not 100% sure if it's all operational, what's out there now yet, because it was being part, done as part of the uh, other contracts. I would expect that the intent would be to use that to give advance warning of lane closures, lane shifts, to make the public aware of that. We're also going to have PVMS signs available for use as well as part of that to make them aware of, of what's going on traffic-wise. So I, it's, it's part of, of, of our signage is to communicate to the public any changes in the road, like for example, when I said uh, transition between stage one and stage two, we're shifting lanes. That's going to be given an advance notice so the drivers are aware that they have to shift so to get through the area. Uh, thank you. Just uh, my question also will be like it's very nice to see consistency on uh, Ontario Highway. Not just uh, we don't need an advertising signs and making sure that we are the, our commuter getting benefit. 
because we had an incident uh, last month on 174 and the highway was closed for seven hours. So we need to make sure we're proactive instead of we're in spending all this money on these technology, making sure we're getting as much benefit as we can from them. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councilor Wilkinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, wondering on the timing of when is this going to start, how long is it going to take, because you have an idea when the different types of closures are going to, to happen, because the, Summer is obviously lower time, but frankly, the 417 eastbound from Moody to, um, to, to Carling now is is packed. And if you add an extra lane, it's just going to be packed for a longer distance because they're always there. Uh, and if you take up to 35% of them off of it, I struggle to think of how it's, what's going to happen. So do, it, it, the scheduling of that would be very helpful to let people, and certainly from the whole West End area, we need to know, to let give people advance notice uh, when they should take their holidays and things like that. And also if some of the worst times, if I can put it that way, when you have low rain, low, if can happen in the summer months, it certainly does make it a little bit easier. Uh, the the uh, design is scheduled to be completed early 2016. Uh, construction is pending funding. Uh, it is on the priority list, but uh, I So can't. if it's funded in next year's provincial budget, so that's 2016 then you start construction next year then? Yeah. What's the duration of the project? Uh, approximately four to four and a half years. Four to four and a half years? Yeah. The first stage, the first stage, stage one will take two years, depending on when the contract comes out. Uh, and that's when most of the ramp, that's when all the ramp closures will be occurring. Once the construction's moved to the median and the inside, all the ramps will be open, and then it's just, it's, it'll be very similar to what's yeah, happening Yeah, it's similar to what you did out further west, yeah. yeah. Which caused chaos for some period of time, yeah. So it's up to about four, four and a half years yeah. of work. Okay, so that would take it into 2020, 2021? Yes. If you got immediate funding? If you got immediate funding, yes. You did a little bit faster when in the east, when the project is widened in the east. It's what was that? Well, when the part that you just did coming yeah. in that we, with the extra lanes that we're using for the buses now, that didn't take you that long. Uh, maybe that's the advantage of design build. I can't, I can't answer it there. They want to get in and out as quickly as possible in design build. Plus, you, the, plus the timelines and the restrictions on them, you had to have the transit lanes open. I know, I know there's so. a reason, but yeah. you can't do it as quickly in this. Okay. Well, I know you'll give us plenty of notice ahead yeah. of time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think, it's, uh, I think the, the problem is going to be severely on, on Carling Avenue. Um, Carling Avenue is the route I use every day to come in because it's better than going on the 417 now. It may be not be in the, at when this construction is underway, but it is getting very busy, and I think it, we're going to have to look at whether there's other alternatives and have our own people take a look at alternative routes because there's an awful lot of traffic coming that way. Thanks. Thank you. Are there, are there any other questions for the delegation? Okay, thank you very much. Received. Thank you. Uh, the next item was uh, held, I believe, by Councillor Fleury, which was the uh, 2016 Municipal Vehicle and Equi Equipment Replacement Plan. Um, before uh, we go to your question, however, I have, I have. Uh, some direction for staff on this. Um, I don't want to hold up the receipt of the plan, but uh, uh, Mr. Wiley, is it possible for your staff to go and look at the possibility of putting side guards or side rails on the, on the larger trucks in the fleet and report back to us what other cities have done in that regard and, and what we may or may not be able to do going forward? Uh, to the chair, it's something we're undertaking right now, and certainly we'll take that direction to come back to the committee on our findings. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so, uh, Councillor Fleury, followed by Councillor Manette. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my question re re relates to um, a, a very specific section of uh, the fleet management, and uh, it's it's not the the heavy truck, it's not the ambulances, it's not the fire trucks. Those are really a specialized equipment, but it relates to the general use of the fleet that we have, let's say for bylaw services or for others. I wonder um, 
Uh, I wonder how prescriptive the procurement is on that uh, regarding uh, electric use, hybrids, uh, the type of vehicle we select. So I'm curious to just find out a bit more on some of the procurement elements for that. Through the chair, we do have a green energy, uh, green fleet plan, and uh, we do procure alternative fuel vehicles uh, through that plan. And I believe we've got a refresh of that plan coming to committee in the fall. So I know that uh, a couple of years ago we um, we brought to our fleet uh, an electric vehicle, and it'd be interesting to kind of understand how that worked out for for our use. Uh, and understand if that's a direction we're heading in. Or, as you know, it's a technology that's evolving. There seems to be more and more brands that are going in, the, in that direction. I wonder if, if those types of vehicles are appropriate for uh, our daily use uh, at the city. And through the chair, I, th I think the plan will flesh this out a little, in a little more detail, but uh, just quickly uh, and probably anecdotally, uh, we had a little, we've had much better luck with the hybrid vehicles than we did with a pure electric vehicle in terms of the, the use, uh, the staff use of the fleet. So I'm sorry, just to go back to the, the, your response around the green plan, so are you coming back to highlight some of those um, green goals, if you will, in, in our fleet purchasing? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Manette. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a general question on the replacement of vehicles. Is it on need basis or is it um, basically once they reach a certain amount of kilometers or where that uh, we look at replacing them? Uh, through the chair, we do have guidelines uh, for the various classes of vehicles, so it's generally done on, a, on an age basis. But having said that, if uh, we have some lower-use vehicles that aren't as, don't exhibit as much wear and tear, then we'll delay some of those vehicles for replacement because uh, generally we have uh, more, even though our, our fleet has uh, improved in terms of the age, generally there's more requirement than there is money. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there in, uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, Councillor Moffat. Thank you. I just um, two things. I know that uh, I remember asking a question on this a couple years ago, and the report um, a, contained a list, an actual itemized list of the vehicles that were being replaced. I don't see that this year. I'm just curious uh, why. Uh, through the chair, I'm not sure we can get that list for you, no problem. Because no. I remember actually okay. had the list of the let's, you know, year, make, and model of the different vehicles. I mean, I understand with snow spreaders, all that stuff, but when it comes to some of the vehicles, there was actually a list of year, make, and model, which I thought was um, useful. But <clears throat> So if you can get that to us, that would be helpful. Um, the other um, thing I had a question on was the replacement funding, your, your annual replacement funding um, over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, your numbers for the next two years are $23 million and $25 million, yet the number goes down. Um, to a low of 15 million in 2021, um, seeing as we replace vehicles in a six to seven year time frame, how is it possible that the cost of replacement can continuously go down over the next 10 years when in all likelihood the cost of the vehicles are going to go up? Yeah, through the chair, that reflects the improving age of the fleet. Okay. So we're, we're, we're doing our best to keep vehicles longer so we, have to, we don't have to replace them as, as often. Uh, through the chair, that's correct. Plus, uh, we've had a good uh, replacement plan over the, ne uh, over the last uh, few years, and that the average age of the fleet has improved. So that's reflected in the capital plan. Right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilkinson. My question was on that same last run. I've, I still find it strange. I mean, it's very important for our long-range financial plan that these forecasts be accurate because that's how we work our whole capital programs on. And it, 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 to have it down to about 50 or 60 percent when we're actually, have the city is growing, so we're actually every year we usually apply a few new pieces of equipment because we have new parks to look after, new roads to look after, etc. Uh, is this, I know it's harder to forecast long distances out, but have you done this in a very systematic way that is, I, I rec recognize what you just said about the age of the fleet, but that's not the only factor to take into account. Uh, through the chair, the various pieces of equipment have different lifespans. For instance, uh, fire trucks 
our 15 years heavy equipment, seven years, etc. So, as I've said, we've over the over the past uh, many years we've in, increased our fleet. Uh, we had, uh, you know, going back to post amalgamation, we have some uh, vehicles that were well beyond the replacement value. So as we've uh, bettered our replacement, our average replacement value of the fleet that gets reflected in the capital uh, funding. Uh, Fleet staff do a very good job and, and track it very closely, so I'm, I'm confident that their projections are accurate. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cadre. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And just coming back to uh, the question that's on the table, Mr. Wiley, how much of the technological advancements on those vehicles have helped uh, the city uh, in terms of uh, acquiring better vehicles, even though they may be costing a little bit more? So how much is that playing a role in terms of not only working with the vehicle, but also future uh, uh, acquirements or requirements for the vehicles? Uh, again, that will be reflected in our green fleet plan. Uh, things like telematics we're looking at. Uh, we've, we've heard from other municipalities that that will improve the performance of the vehicle, the fuel consumption, etc. So those are certainly the sorts of technologies that we'll be looking at. And with everything else we do, we'll do a, ro a robust business case to see if uh, it's, worth, it's worth making those types of investments in our vehicles. Thank you for that, Mr. Riley. And uh, just one further question based on uh, what sometimes the public points out that uh, some of our vehicles, you know, are one, you know, F-150, not to mention trade names, but F-150s that are driving around the street. Uh, I'm assuming that the staff look at those vehicles and say, yeah, this is where we need to do this particular department's uh, responsibilities and also the job that is required on site. Uh, through the chair, that's correct. And in addition to that, uh, when we tender, we award to the lowest uh, responsive bidder. So in some circumstances, it might be a better class of vehicle that has actually cost the city less money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Kakish. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, on the procurement part, you just spoke, um, Mr. Wiley, on the fact that we usually go to the uh, lowest bidder, but in the report you talk about possibly changing that procurement process. Can you speak to that a bit and why we're thinking about changing the lowest bidder uh, protocol? Uh, in, through the chair, in some cases uh, the lowest bidder isn't the best deal for the city, so we take other factors into account. And could you just talk a bit about the procurement process and how, how that works a bit in more detail? How many interests do we get usually when we put this out there for light vehicles? I'm thinking of Bylon and, and those types of vehicles. That's uh, with the chair. Well, this, the tender will have a set of specifications in it and uh, uh, all sorts of things, technical plus warranty, etc., uh, servicing, etc. And when when the responsive bidders come in, we need, normally get uh, you know a number of them. Uh, those things are taken into account. And we usually have a set number of dealers or suppliers that we deal with on that standing offer list. Uh, through the charity, that's correct. Uh, we have no uh, no shortage of bidders. And my understanding is sometimes we lease, sometimes we finance. Uh, how do we determine which is better and, and which is more economically sound when we do that? Through the chair, it generally uh, turns on what the usage is. So, for instance, if we have a short-term requirement, uh, we won't purchase a vehicle, we'll lease it. Uh, if it's a two-year temporary project or something like that, that's when we'll look at leasing vehicles. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I think it will be beneficial if we have, based on some of the questions here, some more details, if staff can follow up with perhaps a small presentation or, or a summary of some of the questions that were touched upon here would be beneficial that may not be included here. I'm not sure I'm following you. You want, uh, you want us to receive this to come, the, to come back? or um, It doesn't have to, but just a bit more information. I think that's not in the port report. It's things like uh, questions that Councillor Moffitt touched upon. And well, some maybe, maybe what we could do is, is Mr. Wiley, if you're prepared to sit down with the two councillors and, and go through their questions in a bit more, in a bit more depth, would that, be, would that be helpful? Yeah. Yeah, through the chair, we certainly can do that. And in addition, as I've said, we'll be coming back with a refresh of our Green, green Fleet Plan. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so received? Received. 
Okay. Uh, next is the uh, pedestrian crossing treatments in Ottawa update to the Ontario Traffic Manual. Uh, we held this uh, because uh, we have a presentation, and um, so I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Kent to come up. Uh, and again, as I pointed out at the beginning of the meeting, right where Councillor Middick is, uh, if he can be our Vanna White, um, no, he doesn't want to be our Vanna White, is uh, what one of the, uh, one of the devices uh, will be looking like and that we'll be seeing out on our streets in the next, uh, in the next little while. And uh, Mr. Kent will speak in more detail about that and some of the other options that these changes to the law are going to allow the city. Good morning. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to introduce Kim Before I'd like to uh, begin, I'd like to introduce Kim Perot. Kim is a PPO for Phil Landry and she's done a lot of work in assisting me in putting this together. Um, so we'll start out uh, and I'd like to thank you, the committee, for the opportunity to present this item today. Uh, via this presentation, I'd like to take you through uh, a brief overview of the related background, the new pedestrian crossover, uh, as referred to as PXOs, as identified in MTOs, updated Book 15 pedestrian crossing treatments to be re released early in 2016, and staff's recommended PXO program. PXO history in Ottawa. PXOs were introduced in the 1960s with open arms and a significant number were implemented. However, the lack and respect caused concerns over the years and in the 1970s and 80s, the, their function and appropriateness were reviewed. By the mid-80s, Regional Council decided to replace them with traffic control signals and the local municipalities followed suit and by the early 1990s, PXOs were phased out in Ottawa. As a video reference, this photo gives you an idea of what the PXO looked like at that time. This is particularly set up, has, this particular setup has a metal cross member where the many or many use band wires. The setup consists of a side mounted signs, overhead mounted signs, flashing beacons, push buttons to activate the beacons, and the markings were double bar crossing lines. In the updated book 15, this crossing still remains and is identified as type A PXO. One of the main reasons staff have developed the PXO program and are presenting here today at committee relates to Council Fleury's motion at TRC in September 2013. That motion had two directives. Reconsider the usefulness of PXOs and actively participate in MTO's ongoing review of pedestrian crossing treatments, which was the active study associated with Book 15 update. This motion was in fact generated over time and was based on a number of pedestrian crossing issues that many councillors and the general public had over the years. Regardless, action on both fronts has brought us to this point. In pursuing committee and council direction, two prominent documents came into play. The province's Bill 31, referred to as Making Ontario a Road Safety Act, which was introduced in the fall of 2014 and included a host of HD amendments, included those associated with facilitating pedestrian movement. This bill was uh, processed through Ontario legislator, legislature and in the following 18 months was passed on June 2nd of this year. Other prominent document, the other prominent document, the updated version of the Ontario Traffic Manual, Book 15, Pedestrian Crossing Treatments, was completed with the input of many municipalities, including Ottawa in the fall of 2014. Specific direction, Bill 31 gave MTO staff provision, provision to finalize Book 15 and to modify the HTA's Regulation 615, which details with what is and is allowed, or with what is and is not allowed in terms of pedestrian movement and how that is accomplished. 
With this direction, it is expected the MTO will deliver its revised Book 15 and Regulation 615 in January 2016. As a result, Book 15 will present three new pedestrian crossing treatments or devices to facilitate pedestrian crossings with the right-of-way when, the when they are crossing the road. These treatments greatly enhance the opportunity for pedestrians to cross the road in a much broader spectrum of conditions related to traffic volume, vehicle speed, and roadway classification. The recommended PXO program, as presented here, revolves around these new devices. Prior to getting into the details of the recommended PXO program, I'd like to take a few minutes to explain what is currently permitted in the HTA, that is, that is prior to going to the, uh, prior to the ongoing changes with the HTA and Regulation 6 v 15 and Book 15, which is currently ongoing for pedestrian crossings. There are two types of pedestrian crossings, controlled and uncontrolled. Controlled, which is the focus of this report, gives pedestrians the right of way while crossing. Conversely, uncontrolled do not. Control, crossing, control crossings are supported by one of the five following measures to provide the right of way. A traffic control signal, full signal or half signal, which is referred to as a pedestrian signal, which is hard to come by and are expensive. Stop and yield signs, which are the sun degree misused to facilitate pedestrian movement. The use of an adult crossing school crossing guard at a school crossing, which we currently have in the range of 200 locations in Ottawa. A police office, which is expensive as well and is used primarily on special occasions or special events. And last, pedestrian crossover PXOs, which MTO saw as the measure to expand upon to better facilitate pedestrians, and we are going to talk more about it in this presentation. Recognizing that we have a need to increase controlled crossings to better support our pedestrians and to ultimately increase the role in a more sustainable transportation and travel environment, the PX program, PXO program has been developed. From a strategic perspective, it is recommended that this be delivered through a three-year pilot project under the following approach. Program kickoff in Q12 of next year, development and delivery of an extensive education and awareness program, Installation, uh, install PXOs at up to 180 locations over that time period, operate the pilot under the Public Works New Traffic Control Device Program, use Book 15 process to select warrant and implement the PXOs, and to monitor and evaluate the program and report back to the community in 2019. So in a nutshell, this is the pilot. So now let's get into the more details, but at a higher level. As mentioned, there are four types of PXOs in the forthcoming Book 15. Type A, the original PXO, and three new PXOs with a new look and feel. Type B, consisting of sign and overhead signs and rapid flash and beacon. Type C, consisting of only one side mounted sign and a rapid flash and beacon, which is currently displayed at the side of the room for demonstration purposes. And type D, in the simplest form, consisting of just the mounted sign. More specifically, typical markings and sign placement. Type A with attritional markings and sign arrangement. It would typically be used for arterial roads with medium volume and high speed. Again, it currently is removed from uh, use in Ottawa at this time. Type B with new markings and sign arrangements includes ladder bar markings for the crossing and yield lines. It would be used on minor arterials and major collectors as well as multi-lane roundabouts. Type C, slim down version of type B PXO, again includes ladder bar markings and yield lines. It would be used on major and minor collectors as well as multi-lane and partially multi-lane roundabouts with lower volumes. And finally, type D, further slim down version just with a sign. Markings remain consistent. It would typically be used for minor collectors and locals as well as single lane roundabouts and right turn channels. For roundabout and channelized right turns, the sign setup would be applied in the same manner as they would be applied in a mid-block location. All configurations would have advanced sign notification, depressed curbs and sidewalks, adequate lighting. Those with flashing beacons or strips would have push buttons and be powered by hardwire connection or solar power unit, again, as displayed at the side of the room. So what is required uh, to warrant and support one of these PXOs? 
specified vehicle and volume levels have to be obtained and reached. These would be identified in Book 15. We would need appropriate sight lines so the vehicle driver and pedestrians have a vehicle visual connection, posted roadway speeds of 60 kilometers or less, appropriate distance from other traffic control devices, standard lighting levels, levels spe specifically for pedestrian crossings, which tend to be brighter than the rest of the road, winter maintain access to both sides of the crossing, AODA compliant curb and sideway depressions and tactile strips. For the most part, these are straightforward. Details can be found in Book 15. I note that the list is I note that the list does provide insight to the fact that POs are more than just a sign at the side of the road with a few road markings. There's a lot that goes into their implementation. Moving to the finance. Funding to cover these costs. Two capital funding sources will exist, the new traffic control signals program and the infrastructure based programs and projects. For the new traffic control device program, it is recommended that 400,000 of its 3 million annual budget be allocated to the PXO program per year for the next three years. For the infrastructure based funding, ISD Capital Works and PGME, ATM and land development projects would provide the funding if a PXO was required as part of the project or development. And the associated operating costs would also be addressed at this t in this manner. For operating, funds would be drawn from public works signs and marking budget. However, given a substantial increase in PXO work, it would be necessary to seek additional funds in the amount of $150,000. This is an operating pressure that would be identified in the 2016 budget process. Having covered the finance, let's quickly review the implementation strategy. The next one. I missed one. Roundabouts, uh, sorry, by the numbers. Desire to implement up to 60 locations per year. If funding and resources permit, that number could go up. It is recognized that with the introduction of PXOs, the environment in which we travel will change. Drivers will need to be far more aware of pedestrians as more PXOs are implemented and pedestrians are looking to cross the road. It will move more into an East Coast mentality where drivers are readily willing and able to stop and provide the right of way. Changing over to this mindset will require a cautious but calculated approach to gradually phase drivers and pedestrians into this revised way of thinking and being aware of each other to a greater degree. The recommended strategy takes this into account and in doing so recommends that in the first year the focus be implemented beyond implementing more type D PXOs that are on lower volume, lower speed roadways, allowing road users to gradually move into the transition with minimal exposure to incidents. Type B and Type C crossings would be phased in to a greater degree on the second and third year of, on a progressive basis. Roundabout, roundabout specifically single lane roundabout should have PXOs implemented in the first years as well um, as vehicle yielding to pedestrians is already high at these locations. Multi-lane roundabouts should fall quickly thereafter for consistency at roundabouts. Pathway conductions will be a target area that the road users, so that the roads that are severed by them can be bridged and greater use of the pathway, pathway network can be realized. In implementing the strategy, the location selected will be done in consultation with the ward councillors with the intent to balance out the distribution of PXOs to the greatest degree possible over three years. Should the program be approved by council, this process will begin in the fall of this year. <laughs> Following up on the implementation strategies, is, it is beneficial to reflect on staff's current understanding of the potential demand for PXOs. There are, two, there are 22 single lane roundabouts and up to eight multi or partially multi lane roundabouts that will require PXOs, and more roundabouts are on the way. Establishing pedestrian right-of-way at roundabouts uh, where there was an identified issue when they were first introduced and remains a priority for pedestrian movement. When the locations requested for the pedestrian signals program over the last 10 years are assessed, over 100 of them will now satisfy the wants for one of these two new, uh, one of the new PXO types. Approximately 45 of the 200 school crossing guards could be converted over to PXOs. There are a number of pathway systems in the former municipalities, specifically Canada, Stittsville, and Cumberland, 
that had marked crossings where the new PXOs could be re uh, where the new PXOs could reestablish these connections. There are many channelized right turn lanes within the city which the pedestrians have raised concern or desired right away. And there's a continual demand for improved pedestrian facilities that are generated on a regular basis at various locations under various conditions from the Department of Branch programs throughout the city and from external partners and agencies. Although the introduction of, PX, of the new PXO is a welcome addition to our mobility toolbox and will greatly enhance pedestrian movement, it does come with some complications. Given the recent Bill 31 wording and Book 15 wording, there appears to, appears to be no room for coexistence between cycling cross rides and PXOs. Wording currently uh, suggests that cycling is not permitted through PXOs. This has the greatest impact at roundabouts where cyclists approach via a segregated cycling track or multi-use pathway. The recent updated Book 15 cycling facility provides a layout where pedestrian crosswalk and a cycling cross ride coexist adjacent to one another, but without the right of way. Both have to yield to pedestrian vehicles. With the introduction of PXO, pedestrians now have the right of way as desired, but the cross ride, cross ride can no longer exist with a cyclist and cyclists have to dismount and walk within the right of way. For cycling to increase its motor share, comfort and convenience needs to be an integral part of the system. The PXO to some degree takes us away. Until this is, revol until this is resolved through revised Book 15 wording and Regulation 615 accommodation, cross slides will not exist at roundabouts or any other PXO crossing. That said, staff will continue to work with MTO staff to find a solution that works for both pedestrians and cyclists so they both play a vital role in the future of our transportation system. Key to the program's success, as previously stated, in the presentation is the understanding, acceptance, and compliance buy-in of all road users and the responsibilities associated with PXOs. In support of this comprehensive, in support of this, a comprehensive education and awareness communication plan can be developed and will be developed and delivered as part of the PXO program. This communication initiative will be based on the Safer Roads Ottawa framework and be compiled with key stakeholders' input and involvement. Its delivery will lead the successful implementation of the PXOs with a kickoff in Q1 and Q2 of next year. Running of the program is a monitoring and evaluation component. It will be used to assess the program's worth value through a detailed look at its processes, selection, accommodation of pedestrians, encouragement of pedestrian movements, stakeholder feedback, etc. This will be undertaken via a collection of key data elements, including before and after pedestrian studies, collision statistics, user feedback, buy-in series, and other similar monitoring processes. As a result, this information will be summarized and reported back to community at the end of the pilot. In summary, MTO, MTO Book 15 and associated re regulations are expected to be in effect by early 2016. Three new types of control crossing devices, PXOs, to be accommodated pedestrian needs under the various conditions. Implementation of new devices through PXO program managed by the Public Works Department will, will start in 2016. Uh, staff will report back to TRC in 2019 on the pilot program, and the success of the program is contingent on Council's approval of the pedestrian crossing treatment update to a traffic manual book 15 report as presented here. So let's just recap uh, by finishing up with the report recommendations. We're asking Council to approve the three-year pilot program, approve 150,000 operating pressure to the science maintenance budget uh, to be considered as part of the 2016 operating budget pressure process, and approve delegated authority to the general manager of public works to approve and amend the selection criteria for production crossings so that we can fully get through the pilot without any hiccups and fully evaluate its, uh, its value. So in conclusion, if there's any questions, I can take those at this time. Thank you, Greg. I'm gonna start off the questions and, and I'm gonna focus in on the, on the conflict between Book 18 and Book 15 and the impact on cyclists. Um, you indicated that the city continues to work with the province uh, in that regard. Do you get any sense, Greg, as to when we may have a resolution of that question? 
or where the province is leaning? At this point, uh, the province is off uh, working on their regulations and getting all the materials prepared for release in, in January 2016. So we don't have a lot of communication with them at this time, but we have made them known of our concerns and uh, hopefully they're processing that information. Where are they leaning? I think at this point they're leaning to uh, not include cross rides at PXOs. I think there's still more work to be done, but I think that's where they're at at this point. Um, but there's still another four months before they release that information, so, so time will tell. Okay, thank you for that. And a follow-up question to Mr. Nahas. Um, with what would, where would the city be, I guess, if we um, ignored this apparent contradiction and designed in such a way as to encourage uh, cyclists to just go on through without dismant dis dismounting before uh, before doing so. What are the liability issues around that? Can you can you speak to the legal implications? Yes, uh, Chair. Uh, in essence, as the road authority, we are uh, entrusted with inviting users to use the road properly and legally. And so, when we create situations that is not approved by either the HTA or the regulations then we take a, a, that risk that if uh, a collision happens uh, then the first case and the first cause will be dealt with by the perpetrators but ultimately the city could be drawn in to that type of uh, situation because we've created that uh, matrix. So, so in short, if I can paraphrase, what you're, what you're saying is that until the change is made, the city should stay with the existing legislation and not try and encourage or entice people to do it to do it differently. Is that is that fair? Yes, that is. And our uh, legal implications comment reflected that the uh, current design is consistent with the uh, with the current legislation and therefore doesn't raise legal uh, implications. However, if we have chosen to take on and, uh, uh, in essence, put cross rides within roundabouts, then we are going to take on that risk and we expose ourselves to potential liability. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I believe Councillor Blair is next on the list. If we can find him a microphone, perhaps you can take Councillor Cactus's seat. Uh, thanks very much. Would you mind going back to the slide with the uh, roundabout on it very quickly? Can you do that one? Perfect, thank you. So uh, roundabouts have started to work very effectively, I think, in communities, but the bigger, or one of the bigger concerns about them has been pedestrian crossings here. So in this diagram that you're showing, um, let's go with the bigger roundabout that's got the cutout. If you activate it on the far, sorry, the, the, the second image farther to the right, if you activate it to cross into the cutout before you cross into the median, Will it activate the system the entire crossing of the roundabout, or is there another button at the median to activate the next crossing? If you had, true chair, if you had a type B or type C where there is an active rapid flasher, there would be another push button in the island, the splitter island. There would be another one. There would be. Okay, so you're really asking them, but so would there be four push buttons basically at a big intersection like that where you've got the pork chop, then you've got the median island, then you've got another pork chop, and then you've got the sidewalk? If type B or type C uh, were warranted for that location, yeah, you could up to, have up to four per approach. Okay. And what do we, what do we believe the estimated cost of each one of these is? The estimated cost is identified in the report uh, it was up to 47,000, uh, 42,000. That's per unit, sorry, I meant per unit. Per, per crossing. So in, in, a, in that scenario, we're talking about almost 200 grand if it's 47 each. You're getting up to that number, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Councilman Minnett is next on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> when we, uh, very interesting concept, I like it. Uh, but when you talk about roundabouts, you're saying single lane roundabouts is a priority over double lane roundabouts. What rationale was it to uh, come up to uh, that conclusion that you should uh, do those first? Through the chair, the fundamental desire to implement crossings where there already is low speed, there's high compliance, there's high buy in. 
that exists for the most part to a greater degree at single lane roundabouts. They're also cheaper to install, so we can get a lot more in at single lane roundabouts as opposed to going to the multi-lane or uh, semi-multi-lane roundabouts. I guess uh, the reason I'm asking is uh, the chances of uh, um, issues arising with a dub double lane roundabout as versus single lane roundabout is probably higher uh, for incidents to occur. occur and I would figure that when you're uh, doing the analyzing of where to put them, that double lane should not be rolled out as a first priority also. Um, through the implementation strategy, the intent is to implement roundabouts that are multi-lane or partially multi-lane in the first year. We just, we're going to do a lot more at the single-lane roundabouts okay. than at the multi-lane roundabouts. Yeah. That's good. As long as it's done in the first year. Because I know in our community, in Orleans, we have at least uh, three and more coming, and they've been very successful. So uh, uh, it would be good to uh, see something like this implemented uh, for pedestrian. Uh, you also mentioned... Uh, Possible uh, locations for where school crossing guards are, are implemented right now. Does that replace the school crossing guards? Is that what you see down the road, or is it just something to be added uh, as a uh, protection sort of to the children? To the chair, that is an option. Uh, we can look at school crossing guards and we can decide if that's where we want to go or not. Maybe it's not the first year that we look into those. We'd see how the uh, the, the PXOs are being adapted to and see if it's something that makes sense at that time and we can move into them there at that time. And last question is, I know you went into a, some detail of how, how it's going to be implemented. Um, will they be, um, and there'll be consultation with uh, counselors, obviously. Um, will it be looking at uh, suburban communities as well as downtown core when you're looking at implementing these? Yes, yeah, so the Chair, we'll try to balance them throughout the city. Uh, there's certainly maybe a greater need in, in certain areas, and we'll try to get that balance over the th three years. It might not happen in the first year, but the intent is to talk to all councillors and try to get that balance. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Councillor Annette, I, I had discussions with staff, and because it is a new initiative, I'd like to see at least one in, in, in every ward um, through this process, just to get the sense of how it works, suburban, urban, rural, everything, just so we can figure out how we can use these best throughout the whole city. Um, uh, Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for this. Mm, a couple of the questions, obviously, have, have been uh, answered that I had, but I wondered that um, because the PXOs now are going to become a standard design requirement, um, uh, Will we be, you know, would it save the money if, uh, if, if we did this uh, to, to put in the lights and wires during our construction phase um, going forward? I wonder if that's something that we've thought about because I'm, I'm guessing that, um, uh, that a lot of the cost is going in and, and, and wiring and uh, setting up the roadway for them. So is, has, any been, has any thought been given to that in terms of uh, pre-construction installation and, and putting in the wires then? To the Chair, uh, yes, it's a good question. And we already have started implementing PXOs, the fundamental foundations of the PXOs at roundabouts, so that is already ongoing. I hadn't mentioned it in the presentation, but okay. it is occurring at this point. Okay. Um, and I just wonder, um, are there um, pedestrian cycling counts, like are there warrants that we're looking at when we put in uh, the PXOs? I, I, I didn't see that in the, uh, in the report and I wonder if that should be added somewhere that, uh, that there are actual warrants to be met uh, for pedestrians. In this case, not cyclists yet, but, but certainly for pedestrian crossings, like is it is it X number over eight hours, or is it just up, or, or can it be a bit subjective? Uh, through the chair, yes, there are uh, a selection and warrant uh, process. So there's a screening process that identifies uh, should a PXO be used or should some other measure be used. And then once you identify that a PXO should be used, there's another table that identifies volumes, uh, road width, speeds, that help identify which type uh, is to be used in that situation. 
Sorry, so, so that does include then uh, pedestrian counts over a certain period of time, is that right? That's correct. Okay. It's over a uh, eight hour period for urban area and a four hour period for rural areas. Okay, 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 thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councilor Wilkinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm very happy to see these. I know why the PXOs were taken out, and I would not like to see that type A back, because what happened was people would push the button and immediately start to walk, and we had a fatality in one of them and injuries in some others, and that was why regional council decided to take them all out. On the other hand, the one that you're, you're type D, in Canada, we actually did a sign just like that one, which wasn't legal at the time. If we used the Quebec wine, it was very similar. It worked like a charm. I mean, it wasn't legal, but it worked. And like, I think your Type D is one that will provide a lot of support for a lot of people because it's less expensive. I don't understand why it's $10,400. You're paying some lines across the road and putting in four signs. That shouldn't cost $10,400. What's, what's the cost from? Through the chair, uh, to put in the depressed curbs, depressed sidewalks, and the tactile strips to make it AODA compliant. Well, so that uh, with the markings, the signs, it all adds up to. But, but lots of the areas where our pathways come out are already compliant. So if, the, if you didn't have to do the curbs, the cost would be in a matter of a few thousand dollars, then, would it? Right. If everything was in place, the lighting, the curbs, uh, you could get uh, a set of PXO, uh, a setup, a PXO setup type D for around two thousand dollars. And they have roundabouts because they already have lighting and already have depressed curbs. Would be in that range then. That's correct. And, and while you're planning in the roundabouts to do, from what you said, I believe you said you start out with type Ds in the single lane roundabouts to get something happening quickly. Yes, that is the intent. Yeah, and they wouldn't need the push buttons unless you found there was a need in that particular location? Uh, unless the volume was extremely high, uh, but we don't expect that, knowing how the roundabouts work at this time. So you should be able to put in, uh, so if the costing, we won't know for each location until you actually identify them all, etc. Are you going to come back to us and you'll know, talk to us, we'll give you the list and you'll probably end up with more than you can actually put in. Uh, how are you going to, do uh, you have a, some criteria you're going to use to determine which ones get in first? Through the chair, at this time we don't have a specific criteria. We want to work with the councillors to find out which ones they think are the best. Uh, with our input, uh, there's certainly some upside and downside to specific locations. Uh, the cross product of pedestrians and traffic would probably give us our best guess in terms of prioritizing. I want one tomorrow before school opens next mm -hmm. week, actually. There's a, I have a new school opening for seven and eights. So we're going to have uh, thousands of kids crossing a road mid-block from Pathway. Mm. Exactly what this is going to help solve. And uh, I think there are others across the city that so But I guess legally you can't get them operational until next year because you don't have all the final stuff on the regs? That's correct. Okay. Um, I'll let the parents that keep asking me about that know. Okay. I won't tell them to call you. <laughs> but I really do appreciate this program. I know Mr. Mayor, we've been, Mr. Chair, we've been working on this for oh, five or six years to try to get the province to do it, maybe even longer, and have it finally come through. And what we've been doing is playing sort of cat and mouse a little bit with it, and people's lives are, in fact, in, involved in this, and it's really important to get it going. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, uh, it's extremely good news. Um, uh, Councillor Codry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And first of all, I want to thank Councillor Fleury for putting his motion forward a couple of years ago on this issue because, as Councillor Wilkinson just mentioned, it is a very important issue in the city and not just one particular ward but across the city. So I want to thank Councillor Fleury for raising the issue at, uh, the, at this table to bring this uh, item forward. Having said that, I do have a couple of questions, uh, Mr. Chair, to staff. And uh, Mr. Kent, you mentioned a couple of areas uh, that you were looking at to go back and revive the existing uh, crosswalks that have been considered uh, not legally formed uh, in the previous years. So, and you mentioned Stitzel as one part of that uh, operation. When you mentioned the number of 180 side uh, crosswalks that you're implementing in the city, is that including the ones that you would be uh, reinstating across the city, or is this 180 brand new ones? Through the chair, there would be 60 per year, and we would look at those crossings that you're referring to. So, again, we would meet with the councillors. If those councillors found that uh, there were priorities, then we would try to implement uh, at those locations. 
So coming back to the question, 180 includes those numbers? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the, um, you mentioned some cost on uh, budget's uh, effect in terms of 42,000 and 47,000. Uh, and the when Council Blay asked the question about per intersection, you said about 200,000. Yet uh, you're looking for only 150,000 in the budget for 2016. Can you just explain that for us as to why? Sure. As uh, through the chair, as uh, Councillor Blay had, 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 had proposed the question, those were for a new roundabout. So starting from scratch, so whatever the program may be to build those, you would be looking at a higher cost. To looking at implementing the crossings at an existing uh, roundabout, they'd be significantly less. Um, as per Councillor Wilkinson's comments, that some of the infrastructure is already in play, so those costs would come down. There's two pieces to the cost associated with implementing PXOs: the capital cost, which we had indicated we would want $400,000 from our $3 million in the new traffic control signals program or device program plus $150,000 operating cost, that would be the budget pressure. Thank you for that, Mr. Kent. And in terms of the operating cost, uh, now, you know, operating cost just doesn't refer to, in this case, uh, to maintain what's already in the system or will be in the system, but more so on an annual basis uh, to repaint the crosswalks in terms of lines and whatever other infrastructure is required. Is that all included in that uh, 150,000 operating budget, or is that over and above to another department in the city to do those line paintings and stuff? To the chair, that is inclusive. All uh, maintenance costs are included in that $150,000. Thank you again. And the final question, Mr. Chair, is about education to the public. Whose responsibility will that be? Will that be the municipality's responsibility or will that be the Ontario uh, provincial government's responsibility to inform the public of these changes and how to uh, work with these crosswalks going in? Through the chair, at this point, we've asked the MTO uh, how they are going to roll this out. They don't see themselves having a significant role in this. They've identified a tool within Book 15 that municipalities can use if they choose to use it they are, for the most part, responsible for educating and making aware of the public and the drivers uh, what it is and how it operates. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Forey. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had everything set up here and my computer restarted, so I'll, I'll start off on my last question that I for sure remember. Um, it, it relates to the, the roundabouts. I know, I know what the, and I, I was reading what, what it said around mixing the cyclists with the, uh, the crosswalk itself. It applies to, uh, to the, any crossing, including the roundabouts. I wonder if there's a way, a different way. So I, I, I hear from the MTO or provincially that within that crosswalk, it's protected and designated for a pedestrian. But if beside it we are to attach a cycling lane, what, what would be the conditions in your mind regarding uh, these various sections that you've highlighted? Through the chair, I think the biggest concern for MTO is when the right-of-way is given to the pedestrian, they can step out on the road, but they're doing it in a slow motion, in a slower motion, all right? The differential speed between the pedestrian and the vehicle is, uh, is greater. A cyclist, if they were moving out with the right-of-way, they'll approach through the intersection quicker and maybe not giving the vehicle enough time to stop. So it really comes down to that. Um, that is why, as far as I can tell, that the province has decided not to allow cross rides beside a PXO where uh, the pedestrian or the cyclist at that point would have the right of way. So how do you fix that? That's a, those are the things that we're looking at right now to try to figure it away. Um, certainly MTO is open to looking at things and said that they would work with us to do that. Uh, we just haven't found a solution. I think they might want to proceed without that solution to start with, but follow up with a solution at a later time. Okay. It, I mean, illegally, cyclists will do it all the time, especially multi-use pathway that connect to, to a roundabout or to a crossing. 
and I'm, I'm not sure that this provide, although there is significant progress and, and improvements for the pedestrian experience, we might be putting a, a bit of conflict into, into this for, for the cycling connections, but you know, it might be a second phase or a second uh, review on, on their part. I, uh, okay, and now the other, you, you go through the, the different types of approach and they're all signage and stuff, but I wonder um, if we go back to some of the strategies that we've put in place now where we delimit, let's say, 30 kilometers with a, a pole in the middle of the road. Uh, in some jurisdiction, it says uh, by law yield to pedestrians or whatever. What's the situation with the changes provincially? Would that would we be able to 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 have that that type of signage? Through the chair, can you just clarify what you're asking? Sorry. So the um, in some jurisdictions, beside uh, in front of the crosswalk, what you'll have is a middle sign that's going to say yield to pedestrian by law. And we've, we see it on the Quebec side, we've seen it in, in the states, in, in different areas. We're seeing it in jurisdictions in Ontario. In the past you've said that it's not legal to do so, that jurisdictions are taking on their own risk in doing so. Have, has the province given us the authority to do that within the new amendments? To the chair, I don't expect it to be. Uh, the regulation 615 that will come out would specify how we can use the PXOs and how they're set up. And there's been no discussion or conversation uh, with us and MTO or any other municipality uh, or identified in Book 15 at this time that would permit that to happen. Uh, I'd like if we could take that specific discussion offline at some point to, to see how it, it makes no sense on arterials or on collectors, but on purely residential road, to me, there, there's some uh, benefits to that type of signage. The other one is uh, specific to stop signs. So I haven't seen in the, the options that you're offering a, a for stop sign uh, at a mid-block to encourage uh, a safe crossing. So I wonder... Uh, if that's be if that would be considered uh, in the pilot to the chair no it won't be considered at this time uh, book 15 and the regulations in the HTL HT don't allow for that either uh, what MTO has done is come back with PXOs to address those situations uh, to use a stop sign is not something that they would prefer to do and uh, there's no intent to change the HT at this time to allow for that Okay. Uh, almost done here. Uh, wondering if you could go again over the numbers. So out of this three-year pilot, you're identifying 60, uh, 60 spots in, in the various wards to implement uh, these different types. Is that correct? That's correct. So every year of the three years, we look at implementing up to 60, and, and we'll do more funding and resources allow for it. And through that uh, 60, through those 60 locations, we will have a mix of type A, not A, we're going to leave A out of the, the equation right now, but type B, C, and D with a focus on D at the beginning, and then ramping up type B and C as, as the years uh, progress. We get the biggest awareness and the safest conditions to start off with using type D uh, crossings. And finally, in the conditions under which you have a series of criteria, uh, I wonder, they all make sense to me, lighting, uh, you know, the speed, minimal speed on the road and so on. I wonder why uh, you, or are, have you considered the, the width of the roads, like if it's a two-lane road or if it's a, a six-lane road, because that would have different impacts on, uh, on visibility of the, uh, the pedestrian or the, the crosswalk itself. Uh, to the chair, absolutely. Um, as per uh, Councillor McKinney's question, what other criteria and the warrant conditions, the width of the road comes into that uh, calculation. Uh, so the wider the road, uh, the, the bigger Most presence you need, so the, the type, type B type sign will be used uh, with the flashing beacon and more awareness uh, and presence with the, with the crossing device. So if you can narrow up the road, you can drop it down to a, a type Type C or Type D crossing. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Durs. Thank you, Chair. I just want to basically, it's not a question, it's just a, a comment. Uh, I want to thank city staff for uh, thinking of this initiative. I know it's, uh, we're all, as a city council, we have these issues across the city. 
and I'm looking forward to be a part of this discussion one-on-one -on -one on, uh, with the group. But also, this is a great initiative to be working with city staff on because it's going to create safety for our pedestrian and especially for us in the rural area. This is a very uh, important element, especially the crosswalking. So I just want to congratulate you on this initiative, and I'll be looking forward to working with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, so um, approved? Carried. <laughs> Carried? Carried. All right, uh, we held the next uh, item, number seven, right of way uh, lighting policy, and I believe that was Councillor Fleury who had a question. Uh, sure question, Mr. Chair. It's about, so I understand where we're heading. I wonder if we've put uh, some analysis on the economics of uh, retrofits. So on our existing, especially on our main streets, uh, have we done some of the costing uh, to see if there are benefits of us going to LED uh, in streets that will not, be, uh, will not be redone? I know where we're going. I know I understand the policy, but I'm more curious on uh, some of the retrofit programs for it. Yeah, through the chair, we do have a report coming in the fall that will outline a complete citywide conversion. Thank you. Any other questions on this? Uh, no? Okay. Oh, tr uh, Councillor Torres. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, Mr. Chair, this is, uh, they took this under consideration. I just will be on the report. I couldn't find uh, how these light will be affected by our natural uh, cold and uh, winter season. I just want a clarification on that. Mr. Wiley, thank you. Uh, through the chair, we have run uh, multiple pilot projects over the last couple of years, and we haven't had any effect uh, during the winter months. Okay. Uh, carried? Carried. Okay. The next uh, item uh, that was held was the carp road widening. Highway 417 Hazel Dean Road, environmental assessment study. We do have a presentation, and we also have a number of uh, delegations to speak to the matter. I want to start off by uh, thanking staff. I know this was quite an ambitious project, and a lot of time and effort has gone into it, so I want to, I want to thank you for that, as well as uh, Councillors Moffat, Kadri, and El Shantiri, who were very involved in the community outreach and discussions with staff to bring us to this, uh, to this point. So I'll turn it over to you, and then uh, we'll, hear, um, we'll hear from the delegation. So if people have any questions, if they could just hold them until after the public delegations, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Hello, Chair. Uh, I'm, my name is Frank McKinney. I'm the Program Manager of Transportation Environmental Assessments. To my left is Ron Clark. He's the Project Manager from Parsons. And to my far left is Jabbar Siddiqui. He's the City Project Manager on this project. Um, in short, carp road widening is, is required for future capacity needs. As well, uh, as part of the carp road widening, we see uh, the enhancement of to other modes is most important as well, and this has been a consideration throughout the extents of the project. Um, in the, as, as you'll see in the recommended plan, uh, we not only took into account uh, extensive uh, public consultation and concerns that the public had, but it also reflects on future growth in the area. So I'll pass it over to Jabbar Siddiqui with the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this presentation is regarding the functional design recommendations for carp road widening environmental assessment study. Uh, the widening limits for carp road uh, is focused on uh, the two kilometer stretch from Highway 417 to Hazel Dean Road. However, the study area, which is shown in the dashed gray line, was expanded uh, northerly and southerly to include the Highway 417 off ramps and uh, the Stutzville Main Street in the south. Uh, this was uh, uh, considered necessary to assess the up and downstream effects of the proposed widening. 
uh, on the presentation outline, uh, first the project project background and, over, and study overview, a summary of the alternative designs that were considered during the EA process, and the resulting recommended plan that has been developed for the corridor uh, will be described next. Uh, this presentation will also briefly cover on the consultation part uh, that the EA study has benefited from during the course of the EA study. Lastly, the next steps uh, will be described uh, which are required to complete uh, this EA study. On the background side, uh, city's official plan identifies carport as an arterial roadway. Carport provides access to adjacent properties and offers uh, the most direct route to Highway 417 for communities living in the Statesville area. It is a designated truck route and is also identified as a spine route of city's uh, 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 cycling network. The corridor serves as a gateway to Statesville, therefore it's an important entry route to Statesville. City's transportation master plan identifies widening of carport as a phase two project, uh, which is scheduled to be implemented between 2020 and 2025. The long-term plan for the corridor is to allow for a development uh, that would comprise of commercial employment, residential, and mixed land use types. On the corridor design considerations, uh, the existing right-of-way within the widening limits of carport is very constrained. It generally varies uh, between 22 meters and 30 meters uh, with the exception of a wider right-of-way at the northern and the southern uh, portions of the corridor. Among the other considerations were included improved traffic operating conditions and safety of road users along the roadway, uh, provide walking and biking facilities to promote active modes of transportation within the corridor. Uh, another consideration was minimize uh, the property requirements in consideration of shallow depths of various abutting properties. Uh, improving the visual environment of the corridor was another factor, uh, was another factor that was uh, contemplated during the study process. Finally, the study also looked at how these design considerations can be addressed within a budget envelope identified in the transportation master in, in the transport uh, TMP's affordable plan. On the design alternatives, the study confirms the transportation master plan need to widen uh, from two to four lanes from Highway 417 to uh, Hazeldean Road. For the four lane widening, various alternative design elements were identified and evaluated. It included roundabout versus signalized intersection design at crossing the streets. Uh, option of uh, narrow median versus uh, wide median was also examined. On-road bicycle lanes versus uh, providing multi-use pathway on both sides of the corridor. Further, as it relates to providing access to abutting properties, the option of two-way left turn lane versus median break was also investigated uh, in this process. The study in consultation with stakeholders established an evaluation criteria consisted of 18 principles with subcategories and which was used to evaluate the alternative designs. Also. A broad community consultation plan was undertaken to obtain feedback from study stakeholders at key milestones of the EA process. Based on the feedback received, a preliminary recommended plan was established which was presented to the study stakeholders in June 2014 meetings. It consisted of an affordable plan and an ultimate plan. Affordable plan provided for four travel lanes for traffic, two lanes each in north and southbound directions. Uh, it also included traffic signals at four intersecting roadways, namely Hazeldean Road, uh, Kittywick Drive, Rathbone Road, and West Brook Road. The plan also included multi-use pathways on both sides of the roadway to encourage active modes of transportation along the corridor. A central two-way left and lane was also provided in some locations to allow for left in and left out traffic movements to and from the properties that abut the corridor. The plan also included intermittent raised medians that allow for greening opportunities. The ultimate plan included two southbound through and two eastbound left turn lanes at Carp and Hazeldean intersection to meet future travel demand at this location. However, its implementation is identified as a post-2031 project. 
following the June 2014 uh, consultation meetings, the study stakeholders provided additional input, indicating a preference for roundabout design along the corridor. As a result, the preliminary recommended plan was revisited for intersection options at Rothbond Road and Kittiwick Drive. Options evaluated included signalized intersections versus around, uh, roundabout uh, designs at these two locations. An additional round of consultation was undertaken in spring 2015 in which both alternatives were presented to obtain feedback from the project stakeholders. This slide shows the various design features including the footprint of signalized intersection versus uh, the roundabout design. Signalized uh, intersection option was provided at uh, Westbrook, Road, uh, Westbrook Road and Hazeldean Road, while roundabout options were considered at Rothbond uh, Road and Kittiwick Drive. While the roundabout option has some advantages, its footprint is comparatively much larger than the signalized intersection option. This would mean a much greater impact on the properties adjacent to it. And this slide shows a cost comparison of the two alternatives. The cost to implement the signalized intersection design, which is shown here as an alternative A, along the two kilometer stretch is estimated as 17.9 million, whereas the cost to implement a hybrid solution, which includes two roundabouts and two signalized intersection, is estimated as 20.7 million. Alternative B is 2.8 million more expensive than the alternative A. It is relevant to mention that city's affordable plan identifies $18 million in 2015 uh, dollars funding envelope for this project. Uh, the spring 2015 consultation reiterated the varying viewpoints among the study stakeholders. Majority of the residents and businesses within the widening limits support uh, the signalized option. However, majority of the stakeholders outside the widening limits of corporate support the roundabout option. Following the additional round of consultation in the spring 2015, a recommended plan was established which reconfirmed signalized intersections along the corridor. The rationale were vehicle travel time through the two through the two kilometer corridor length was determined to be equivalent for the recommended plan and the roundabout option during peak periods. Uh, the recommended plan also avoids displacing buildings and businesses. It has less impact on uh, uh, business access. Also, the land acquisition requirements are less in signalized intersection option. Further, it fits within, uh, the, uh, within the budget that's identified in the transportation master plan's affordability plan. This slide shows a typical cross-section of the recommended plan. Multi-use pathways are provided on both sides of the corridor. Uh, the intersections are provided with traffic signals. Uh, in, uh, Raised medians are provided at intermittent locations and a two-way left turn lane is provided in some locations along the corridor to provide access to or from uh, the properties uh, and the businesses along the, uh, the car road. And uh, the next steps are to finalize the environmental study report taking into account transportation committee and council decisions and filing of the uh, environmental study report for the 30-day public review period. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to present the functional design recommendations for carport widening environmental assessment study. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask you to stay up there uh, until we go through the public delegations in case there's questions from uh, committee members. Our first public delegation is Adam Thompson from Novatech Engineering. Uh, good morning. You have uh, five minutes. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of uh, Transportation Committee. Um, this item uh, <clears throat> actually came to our attention uh, uh, yesterday through uh, reviewing the uh, Transportation Committee agendas. Um, and uh, we were aware that uh, we have a, a client that, that owns a large, large piece of 
property uh, to the east of, of Carp Road. Um, and uh, upon notifying them, uh, they were aware that the, the project was underway, uh, but were not uh, 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 completely informed on, on what the implications were for their property. And we, uh, the, the purpose of our, our delegation today is to uh, essentially raise awareness for uh, for the, this property and uh, and the potential impacts uh, down the road for the the uh, Carp Road corridor, um, the the area that the area of land that we're that we're talking about uh, is approximately 71 hectares, um, that uh, with some limited frontage on uh, on Carp Road in between uh, Lloyd Alex and and Westbrook. And uh, the main concern that we have is that uh, these lands are designated as developing community in the official plan. Uh, they were brought into the urban boundary uh, through one of the recent uh, reviews. Um, this land could potentially, or even uh, perhaps as a, a minimum at the uh, Stand, a standard official plan policy of 35 units per net hectare could accommodate 2,500 units, um, and that, that would be a minimum. There's also additional lands between these lands and the 417 that could, in theory, be developed as well. And um, that development could very feasibly occur within the, the time frame uh, of the, the construction that's being looked at. And uh, one of the things we, we noticed is that there are uh, few, if any, uh, opportunities to connect these lands to Carp, Carp Road in order to have a, uh, a relatively direct connection uh, to the 417, which would likely be uh, the, the main uh, point of access for, for this, this future community. Um, and so, uh, while well, we appreciate that uh, this process has been going on for, for some time, um, and uh, certainly we don't uh, don't want to uh, hold up the process in, in any way. We would like to see if there's any opportunities to uh, to either uh, have some recognition that there would be a need for for uh, future. Uh, collector road or, or major collector or perhaps even an arterial that would connect to the east um, at some uh, at some point uh, in this uh, section of the corridor so that's uh, that's the, the points that we wanted to uh, to raise with committee um, if there's any questions of myself are there any thank questions much. delegation Councilor Codrick Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Thompson, thank you for coming in to do your presentation this morning. When you say east of Carp Road, that uh, there's some property that you represent, or not you, but your uh, partners represent, uh, any idea exactly what property are you speaking of? Are you speaking of north of Rothbone Road or south of Rothbone Road on Carp? This is, uh, through the chair, this is north, north of Rothbone Road. Uh, at one time it was known as the uh, West Carlton Estates. Uh, there was a proposal for a, uh, an estate lot subdivision many, many years ago, um, which uh, ultimately got shelved and, and would be uh, uh, at some point in the next few years we would expect to come back as, a, as an urban development. Um, being a development communi uh, developing community designation, there'll be a requirement to go through a uh, CDB process, very similar to uh, what Area 6 went through at the south end of Stittsville. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, response, Mr. Thompson. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have one question of staff based on the public delegation's uh, comment. Uh, or do we want to wait till? Pardon? Related to this, yes. Thank you. So back to staff. Now, in terms of the, uh, the what you've heard from Mr. Thompson, uh, were the organization notified of the widening coming forward uh, through a letter or something that you distributed out? Uh, the notice of a study commencement was... The notice of a study comm commencement was sent to all the properties that abut the corridor, and that includes the two properties that Mr. Adam uh, is uh, uh, was representing. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for the delegation? Okay. Thank you for coming down this morning. Thank you. Um, 
The uh, next uh, delegation we have is uh, Roddy Bolivar, who is here on behalf of the Carp Road uh, BIA. Thank you, sir, and you have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thanks for seeing us today. Uh, my name is Roddy Bolivar. I'm the executive director of the Carp Road Corridor Business Association. Uh, the Carp Road Corridor is a designated employment area in Ottawa's official plan and currently home to about 3,000 employees and 300 businesses uh, within the study limits from Rothbourne Road to the 417 is, is part of the corridor. Uh, a number of our members front on Carp Road and there's also the Reed Business Park which is at the intersection of uh, Westbrook. Uh, we'd like to thank Jabbar and his team uh, for the work they did on the consultation process, there was a public, or sorry, a business consultation group and four open houses, and many of our members participated at all available opportunities, and at all times, Jabbar and his team were respectful of our input and very responsive to our input. Uh, road infrastructure is an essential element of all businesses, and certainly businesses that front on a road, businesses that access a road. In our business area, we have a high volume of truck traffic, the employees, commercial traffic. So this project was, was very important to us, and, and uh, members and the business association on behalf of all members participated very actively. We brought forward two main issues uh, with regards to the, the carp road proposed four lanes, and that had to do with the efficiency of truck traffic and access, and also the efficiency of business access. Uh, a number of the businesses along Carp Road are small businesses. Um, McHugh and Gasper, for instance, relies on the traffic both in the afternoon and evening to access their site buy gas, use the convenience store, a number of the other businesses are similar. We're here today to uh, speak in support of the recommendation, the recommendation at Westbrook for a signalized intersection very specifically addresses our concerns about truck traffic exit from Westbrook. Fully loaded trucks entering a very busy road, we felt we really need the signalized intersection to have the opportunity to move into traffic. Also uh, the plan for a, a fifth lane or a turning lane at intermittent locations on uh, Carp Road very much addressed our members' concerns about access to their properties in both the morning and afternoon. Uh, much of that uh, access is from traffic moving through the area from Stittsville, from other locations, but it also happens in some cases 24 hours a day for some of our members who operate all day. So again, we'd like to speak in support of the recommendations and thank Jabbar and his team for the good work they did. Thank you. Are there any questions for this delegation? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, the, uh, the next and final delegation is uh, Peter Condras, who I believe is speaking on his own behalf this morning. Sir, and you have uh, five minutes. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, my name is Peter Condros. I own a fairly large uh, property on uh, this section of Carp Road. I am a resident, a uh, business owner, and a commercial property owner. I represent the properties, uh, the businesses that are operating on my property, of, uh, together with the flea market, Ritchie, Feed and Seed, Jason's Landscaping, uh, Pong's uh, Poutine Food Truck, and a few others, it amounts to about 35 different businesses. Uh, we all, and myself fully, agree with this uh, EA recommendation, and uh, we support it 100%. Uh, I wish to thank Jabbar Siddiqui and his team, as well as the team from Parsons for using uh, for, for the, the hard work they have done and using the due diligence to get uh, this matter through and uh, that's just about all that I have to say thank you very much uh, thank you are there any questions for the delegation thank you for coming down um, uh, any questions from committee members for staff Yes, Councillor Kakish. It's, it's actually on, on the first presentation. There was a characterization that they just found out about this yesterday, but I'm assuming, as Councillor Cottery pointed out, they've worked and they've been notified. Have we tried to work to resolve this issue, or is it something that's not resolvable? Or can we get an update on that? 
And is it strictly the median that's the creating the access movement issues? And through the chair, um, thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, we we have throughout the entire study process been uh, taking into account the properties um, that were referred to, and the fact that there are lands designated east of Carp Road and south of Westbrook for a developing community. And so we've known that and in taking that into account during our process and in our designs. And the most important part of how our design responds to that um, future planning is that the width of the median in that location is a very specific number, it's five meters. When you have a five meter median, it provides you the opportunity to, um, to implement a range of intersection types, whether it be a full signalized intersection with traffic lights, uh, median break, two-way left turn lanes, and so forth. So what our response is, is that when the development, when the applicants submit development applications and do their uh, due diligence with city planning staff, then they will have that opportunity to determine uh, with the city the, the best possible access for those properties. And so that may come at a later date or a prior date to that, depending on whenever that application comes forward and whenever the affordability plan for this road widening actually comes to fruition. To the chair, um, yes, that is correct. Okay, okay. thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Cotry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just coming back to the question that um, Councillor Kakis just put on the table. In terms of slide number 12, if you can go back to that for a moment, please. On the uh, top uh, picture, you indicate raised median uh, for a short distance, and then I guess I'm assuming the darkened area, the black area, is the left or right turn lane. Am I correct? For the raised median, the yellow one. That's the portion for the raised median, right. and that's the median, concrete median uh, of, uh, for the left turning uh, lane. Okay, question though, if you're kind of talking a complete median at that intersection or that portion, is that a mountable median or is that a raised median also? It's, uh, it's a raised barrier. So they're both raised medians right across? That's correct. Okay, so in that particular section, there is no left or right turn lanes? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Now, uh, just coming back and carrying that discussion further, if you go further southbound, I'm assuming, on the right-hand side of the picture, again, that's a darkened area in terms of a median, and I'm assuming, again, that that's a raised median. That's correct. Okay. Uh, in terms of traffic signals that are recommended by the report versus roundabouts, uh, most of the median in that two kilometer corridor would be a raised median based on the fact that the traffic lights in the middle of the road would need that raised median. Um, through the chair, um, so in our designs um, in between, in the, in the blocks between the intersections, We've included as much as possible uh, of that distance as the two-way left turn lane. And the raised medians are, are sporadic, as, as Mr. Uh, Sadiq uh, mentioned, they're intermittent. And um, so I would hazard a guess of approximately 50% uh, is two-way left turn lane, and 50% is barrier in one way or another. Okay, and the second half of the 50% that you described is not a mountable median. There are definitely raised medians. Through the chair, yes, that is correct. If it's not a two-way left turn lane, it is a barrier median, not mountable. Thank you for that. In terms of, uh, you mentioned that there were four open houses in the community, and I want to thank you for holding those four open houses. Uh, I think the city, as well as uh, the people in the room, got good information, both uh, based on traffic signal and also roundabout. Uh, just a question, if you can summarize maybe in two or three comments about um, what was the feeling around the rooms in the four different open houses and if you can take us from open house one to the last one if you wouldn't mind doing that i would appreciate it for the committee members 
uh, through the chair. Uh, the general feeling in the open house uh, meetings, the first open house was just an introduction of the project and uh, the different options, the design options that were presented in the meeting. So the, meeting, the feeling was mixed. And as I mentioned uh, in, in my presentation, that uh, the community is, is divided. Those who live within the widening limits of uh, uh, the carport, uh, they were for signalized options. And those who use it as a commuter route, they were for, for, for the roundabout design. So the community is divided uh, between uh, uh, the roundabout design and, and the signalized design. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Siddiqui. Uh, in terms of uh, you also received, I'm sure, some electronic correspondence, both from the community as well as from the Carp Road community. Uh, and uh, you did send us some numbers both to the chair and myself. In terms of those uh, numbers, uh, what did the comments come back at? Uh, forgetting about the number of comments you received and how they were split, but more so what were some of the comments you received on the electronic uh, feedback? Uh, through the chair, uh, most of uh, the comments uh, that were received through electronic uh, media was uh, in favor of uh, roundabout design. And uh, they were also from both portions of the community, the carport corridor community as well as the as community at large. Uh, uh, through the chair, it's uh, difficult sometimes to segregate those people because through the emails they only provided their names. So we were not sure whether it's coming from uh, those who live within the widening limits or it's coming from those who are outside the widening limits. Thank you again. And. Um, just a question. In terms of the traffic operation staff of the city, were they consulted on this pro program or was it strictly driven by uh, program management uh, group in terms of planning? Uh, they were part of uh, the study team and they were consulted at all major uh, uh, decision points uh, uh, during the EA study. And their final comment, I guess, would support the recommendations of the report? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Um, in terms of a third party review, was that ever considered for this project? Because it is a rather large project uh, with a big bill to it. Was third party uh, review ever considered? Uh, through the chair, the third party review was not considered, but I mean, if it is undertaken, uh, uh, the study recommendations are not going to change. They won't change based on because of the cost of the study, possibly, or based on the recommendations of the study or third party? It's because uh, there are 32 different factors that were considered uh, 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 when we were comparing the two design options, and that was one factor, uh, the traffic progression. So even if the, uh, and we know that uh, the roundabout design offer a, mo a better progression, uh, a third party review, if it uh, shows a roundabout design, so that will, be on, that will be considered only as one factor. So it's still the other uh, uh, factors will support uh, uh, the signalized intersection design. And in the report, it mentions about the pedestrian safety at roundabouts versus uh, signalized intersection. The Before we go there, uh, Councillor, I believe um, Vivi Chi wanted to weigh in on your, uh, on your last question. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the question about the third party review, um, the whole issue uh, uh, for roundabouts versus intersection was the progression of traffic through the corridor. And as Mr. Uh, Siddiqui's presentation indicated, that uh, when the team looked at the uh, travel times, they appeared to be very um, close to each other. Marginally, there's very little difference. So with that, um, that's why the, the team recommended uh, the signalized uh, uh, option because of all the other benefits. So with a third party review, they would go through the same information, they would probably come up with the same conclusion, and that's why Mr. Siddiqui said that uh, the outcome would not change, and so we didn't pursue the uh, third-party review. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shi, for your comments. Uh, just another comment in terms of coming back to the uh, other people looking at the study, or other portions of the study. 
The Westbrook intersection, both Council Moffat and myself agreed to leaving that as a traffic light as it currently exists. And based on the light industrial zone or with heavy truck traffic on Westbrook, that was the decision made at that time going, you know, in the first place to leave that as a signalized intersection. When you went back and looked at the traffic flows and also looked at the carport current operation, did you look at the queuing of that traffic light back to the 417 at all? Was that ever looked into the plan? Um, yes, through the chair. So um, what our traffic analysts um, looked at was uh, in the post-construction situation, so post-widening. So that's the uh, four-laning of Carp Road, and that was the baseline for all of their um, analyses. And it is the widening and the various improvements at the intersections, including installation of left turn lanes in particular, that address and helps to address the queuing issues that are experienced today. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, but you didn't specifically, or your traffic consultant didn't specifically look at the current operation of the Westbrook intersection in terms of queuing of traffic, not necessarily just at peak periods, but in, uh, throughout the day in both directions on Carp Road, even though it's a single lane road at that interjection, um, other than the fact that there is a right turn lane already existing onto Westbrook. Through the chair, yeah, just, just to reiterate, our, our focus was on the post-construction um, scenario, so what would happen when the road was widened. So we didn't uh, dwell a lot on the existing conditions. However, our analysts were, were very much aware there are some operational uh, issues at Westbrook intersection. Uh, coming back to the, some of the numbers that are mentioned in the report in terms of roundabouts, uh, accident rate, fatalities versus signalized intersection. If you wouldn't mind repeating those for the committee members, I think that would be an interesting fact in terms of uh, how a roundabout may or may not be safer than a traffic signal? Um, so through, through the chair, um, maybe just a clarification. Um, Mr. Sadiq and I are, are recalling comments that he's made today about safety of roundabouts. No, I'm talking about in the report, I thought I read uh, that it does mention, uh, not a comparison, but per se, throughout the report it says, or seems to give the impression, that uh, roundabouts uh, may or may not be safer than a signalized intersection. Okay, so, so through the chair, um, the, the evaluation of the two uh, options, A and B, um, is documented in document number one in your package, and that's the document that is a table with a lot of green dots and so forth. Um, the question of safety um, comes up on that table and in that evaluation a few different times. It comes up when we talk of pedestrians, for example, and you'll see the, sig the signalized option um, scores differently than the roundabout option based on various indicators, such as the total length of a pedestrian's journey, um, the separation of vehicles from pedestrians and the actual length of the crosswalk itself. So there's quite a varied, uh, they score differently on different um, criteria. So that's um, the one area where we do talk about um, safety in terms of motor vehicle safety. Um, we do document that the roundabout option would result in a slightly safe, slightly improved um, reliability of travel time through the corridor and um, relatively um, equivalent in terms of safety except the left turning vehicles, the roundabouts, we're scoring a little better than signals because we don't have the left turn movement happening at roundabouts. So the answers are on, on document number one. Thank you for that, and just not to belabor that point, but the pedestrian safety issue, looking at what was presented earlier in this committee about the crossover walk, uh, walking uh, facilities, that should help going forward in terms of the roundabout. Mr. McKinney, I see you shaking your head. Yes, that, that definitely will help uh, the pedestrian safety. We have concerns uh, on roundabouts about pedestrian safety, and these measures will definitely help 
in uh, the evolution of the roundabouts as we implement them throughout the city. So today, even though the concerns exist today in the current configuration of roundabouts, in the future that will be sort of resolved or absolved going forward? It should be, yes. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Cuddy, that's, that's going to have to be your last question for now if you want to go back on the list, but Councilor Moffat's been waiting to have his opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I don't need to go back. I just need to uh, sort of finalize my comments going forward. Okay. Are, are you okay with him doing that now? Yeah, Councilor I don't have any questions to staff, so it's, it's okay. So go ahead, and then Councilor Moff will go. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And first of all, I want to thank uh, my colleague, Councilor Moffitt, as well as staff for working uh, with us uh, in terms of uh, finding uh, uh, what I think is a solution. Maybe not a perfect or a good solution, but it is a solution. And the reason why I say that is because for both of our wards, including also Councilor Shinteri's ward, the widening is the key for Carp Road. Uh, because our communities have been asking for this widening for a long, long time. And I think uh, in order to not to delay this project further from an environmental assessment point of view, uh, I'm going to recommend support from my behalf uh, of the report going forward. Throughout the discussions of the design for this project, I've noticed that I strongly support the design using roundabouts at major intersections opposed to traffic signals, especially on Arteria Road. The city, along with other municipalities in Ontario, has highlighted the benefits of roundabout and is incorporating them throughout not only this city but other municipalities. In my opinion, Carp Road would benefit from the continuous movement of traffic at all hours of the day, and roundabouts require less maintenance, can operate during power outages, and eliminate requests for turning signals. I strongly feel that roundabouts should be installed at the intersection of Kittawake Drive and Rockpoint Road, and I do not support the report recommendation for traffic signals at these intersections. The traffic light at Westbrook Drive should remain to assist with the movement of heavy truck traffic for Westbrook uh, because of the concerns that were expressed in some of the open houses about the navigability of a roundabout for heavy trucks or large trucks. Uh, in terms of the Carp Road to uh, the north of Carp Road from uh, Rothmore Road, which includes, uh, as Mr. Condress mentioned, his business and along with his other businesses, uh, that to me a turning lane would have been a solution which is what partly is incorporated in this. And that, if I can remember to my memory currently, uh, in the first open house, that discussion was put on the table, not so much for a turning left lane or right lane, but more for a mountable median uh, at that point, and the businesses seem to be relatively satisfied with that. Given the benefits of roundabout, I feel it only makes sense to have carp road be included with a mix of intersections. Carp road is intended as an arterial road to accommodate high volumes of traffic. Installing roundabouts will provide continuous movement, as I said earlier, on the road where a signalized intersection will impede the flow of traffic on the road. It is important that all users of the road are considered and not only the businesses located along the corridor. I appreciate that the businesses and residents located on the road would prefer traffic lights, but there are many other users of this road, as you mentioned earlier in the presentation about the community surrounding the Carp Road Corridor. I do not support traffic signals, but overall need for the community, and based on that, I will be supporting staff's recommendation. Having good discussion on the two options, I feel that both the community and staff were better informed on the options of roundabout versus traffic lights. Glad to see that discussion was raised, and I'm happy to hear that that discussion did have some implications on the report going forward. I do appreciate, like I said earlier, the support of the two uh, co colleagues, Councillor Shantieri and Councillor Moffat, and I also appreciate the support from Chair uh, Aglai in terms of coming to an agreement on this uh, report going forward. Uh, I think this report may need to be revisited if and when the EA is done and when the actual implementation of the report comes into play on the CARP road. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my committee members. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Caudry, and, and thank you, Councillor Moffat, for making space or room uh, for Councillor Caudry to uh, finish up, um, and uh, I'll turn it over to you as the last speaker. Thank you. I, I won't take uh, too much time. I just, um, there's a, we have a, Councillor Caudry and I have a unique relationship. It's, it's not, 
uh, we end up working together on a lot of files because Rio Goulburn happens to be southwest and north of Stittsville Ward, so it's we kind of come at it from all different angles. But uh, it's uh, this has been a tough one to work on because I know um, it's two very different communities, distinct communities when it comes to um, the area that I represent along Carp Road, and then of course the village of Stittsville and the, the different uh, the varying priorities. But I just want to thank. Um, uh, first and foremost, Councillor Kadri, uh, for working on this file, um, and along with staff, um, certainly the staff from uh, from Parsons. I would still prefer to call you Delcan. I like the name Delcan better, but uh, you guys went and changed it. So, um, and then of course uh, Jabbar and Frank, uh, and then uh, first and uh, uh, most importantly, actually um, the residents. Uh, we went through. I don't think I've ever had more positive public consultation or open houses on any file than than this file. And uh, certainly Peter is here today, Peter Condress is here today, he was involved every step of the way. Uh, other, other property owners, um, Ashley Jones and, and Rock Cusinato and Dave White, um, they've all been uh, uh, quite, uh, quite strongly involved in how we've uh, progressed in this, uh, in this project. And very pleased to see it here today uh, before us with a resolution. Um, I know it's not perfect, as, uh, as Councillor Kadri said, but uh, certainly it works. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't make the situation worse, uh, which is which is the, the the key thing. It makes everything better in in the reality. And, and uh, once you look at the the two different options, roundabouts versus signalization, and you can tell that you still get from point A to point B in the same speed. Um, obviously, the uh, it comes down to, to funding, and certainly um, the option before us keeps us within our our affordability scope uh, as part of our TMP, which I think is the most important thing because what we want to do is is get this project done as soon as possible and earlier the better in the 2020 to 2025 uh, uh, time frame. So certainly I know Councilor Kadri and I will be uh, working on that uh, to make sure that um, that the residents in Stidsville and in, uh, along the carport corridor uh, see some improvements in that area as soon as possible. So thanks again, staff, thanks to the residents and thank you Councilor Kadri and to the committee uh, for your indulgence. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Kerry? Okay, thank you. Um, any notices of motion for consideration at a subsequent meeting? Okay, any inquiries? I do. Uh, Councillor Fleury. Uh, understanding that significant investments are made to the city's roadways through renewal and day to day maintenance, how does the city protect those investments when road cup? permits are given to uh, private applicants or utility companies in maintaining proper grade for drainage and appearances. Okay, thank you for that. And, and there's we, another, oh, sorry. This one comes from a BIA. Um, could staff please describe the city standards for sidewalk interlock maintenance replacement in terms of meeting accessible requirements and appearance on our main streets? Okay. I got an inquiry one day, I think. How many inquiries has Councillor Flory made? Um, <laughs> so, um, anybody else have any inquiries? Any other business? Okay, our next meeting is October the 7th, and uh, adjournment? Yep, thank you very much.